Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. Today, I'm here with Maria Java Payne, and she is a psychotherapist, and she's amazing. And she today wants to talk about trauma, what it is, how it affects the brain, different types of conditions and illnesses that can be brought on by trauma, and how the brain could actually heal itself. These things are truly amazing conversations that I think we need to understand, know about, and how psychotherapy plays a huge role in the healing process of the brain and what it's capable of doing. So M Maria, I'm so glad you came on the show today. Can you introduce yourself, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Sure. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a somatic psychotherapist. I'm currently based in Minneapolis, Minnesota in the United States. I, at this point in time, have my own private practice. So I see people for really deep healing work uh, related to trauma and addiction. I'm a clinical social worker and also a licensed alcohol and drug counselor working with a wide range of conditions, but specifically really focused on PTSD and complex PTSD, racial trauma, generational and ancestral work. Um, I do intensives with people, so I don't do the hourly, weekly kind of therapy that most people might think of when they think about going to see a therapist. I have people coming from all over the country to work with me for uh, five, six hours a day, upwards of a week, sometimes a little bit more. So we do about 30 hours of therapy in one week and really get to the roots of what people are navigating and, and helping them heal instead of spreading it over a long period of time. So um, it seems to fit a niche um, for, for people that are wanting to just be done with carrying around the heavy backpack full of rocks. Yeah. Uh, I'm also an international brain spotting trainer, so we'll talk a little bit about brain spotting today, but I um, teach uh, clinicians all over the world on how to utilize the somatic psychotherapy method that really rapidly helps heal from trauma, heal from stress conditions, and really helping to get back into the connection with the body and the brain and turning on the connection with the nervous system so that people can heal. So I also practice using um, psychedelic assisted therapy. I'm a certified breathwork practitioner. I'm also a shamanic practitioner. So I blend a lot of different tools. And I was telling Stacy before we got started that uh, I, I don't swim in the kitty end of the pool. <laughs> so <laughs> most people who come and work with me are ready to, to go there and um, take a deep dive. So it's a little bit about me. I love it. Now, what exactly is trauma? Because that's a, you know, that's a word that has a, a broad range and everybody has their own definition of what they think trauma is, you know, from a psychotherapist point of view, what is trauma? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So trauma is something that overwhelms the nervous system and it can be a result of not enough of something too much. So uh, too soon, too fast, right? Like things that the body and the mind aren't um, not able to manage. And so this experience of overwhelm happens and the system sort of loses connection to the resources it has to navigate a stressful experience. The other huge piece to trauma is isolation. It creates, it has an essence of isolation, uh, within it. So when we experience something traumatic, we often feel alone in it or disconnected from other people. And then how people respond to the trauma can almost be like an insult to injury uh, because many of us don't know what to do when someone has experienced something really challenging or difficult. And it doesn't even have to be something, you know, what we might see, like you might think of a car accident or illness or a natural disaster or something as traumatic, which they are, but there's much more of what we call developmental trauma, you know, inside living inside of us. And that has to do with how we were raised, how we were emotionally tended to or not. And if we experienced a sense of secure connection to our caregivers who could then reflect that and help our nervous system build that sense of inner security. So many of us are dealing with attachment wounds, right? Mm -hmm. And that um, is 
significant in our world and our culture that we've forgotten how um, to take care of our selves and you know relate to one another and traumatic experiences that happen cause us to shut down so then we have a harder time taking care of our kids and relating and having uh, open connections because we feel if we close down it'll be safer that way but ultimately it what you know kept us alive at one point the ways that we managed a situation keeps us from living eventually so so when a person goes through different types of, because it could be caused by stress itself, it can, you know, like you said, it doesn't have to have become, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a traumatic event like a car accident or hitting your head abruptly. It could be from many things, any, anything that's traumatic in your life that's kind of set you off, you know, and you don't know how to deal with could actually be, you know, a, a sense of the definition trauma. Right. Correct? It's, it's a stressful experience that, uh, you without res uh, outside resources can't bring yourself down back into what we would call homeostasis if we're looking at it from a scientific point of view. Now, how does a, a psychotherapist help somebody that is dealing with a traumatic um, trauma in their life that they are unable to deal with on th themselves? How mm -hmm. could a psychotherapist help them? Mm-hmm. So I think it depends, first of all, on the type of psychotherapy. Um, like I mentioned, I'm a somatic psychotherapist. So everything I do orients people back to their bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's important to remember that our emotions are of the body. They're not of the mind. Right. Um, we've had this really interesting sort of Western purview that our, our thoughts, our emotions, everything is in the head, right? And so talk therapy has been the Western way for of, of helping someone with a mental illness or condition or trauma um, for much of, of the history of psychotherapy in the United States um, in the Western world. But over the last 20 to 40 years, we are getting more information through neuroscience and returning to the roots of the body um, to recognize that trauma is held in the body. It's not held in your mind. Um, your mind is reflecting something that your body is holding. So in the way that somatic psychotherapists do this work is that if you were to come into my office, Stacy, and say, you know, I'm having a really difficult time with a relationship, right? And every time I get into a conversation with this person, I feel really sad and really irritated and angry. I would say, okay, where do you notice that? Where mm -hmm. do you notice that inside of you, this anger, this anxiety, this irritation. And maybe you would tell me, I feel it in my chest, or I feel like I'm clenching my jaw or my, my hands are turning into fists. And yeah. so what I would do is have you really notice the sensations of that and become attuned to you, holding a really secure, grounded, loving, compassionate space that is the opposite of trauma, right? Yeah. It's a sense of safety and attunement and connection so we would then guide you to notice those sensations. And as you start to notice your inner experience, the experience begins to change because the body starts to metabolize the emotions when it senses, oh, it's safe now, it's okay. Or I have someone here that's listening to me. So then we can move and metabolize those survival energies that are there. That's what the tight jaw and the tension in the chest, it's like preparing for a fight, flight, freeze, fawn or collapse response, those are all ways that the nervous system reacts to stress or trauma. And as we move those things out of your nervous system, then you're gonna have so much more room to do the problem solving and the thinking about how to tend to this relationship. So your space will sort of be freed up. It's like clearing out the hard drive a little bit so that you can add some new techniques and skills to resolve the issue. but when we're emotionally charged or activated, it's really hard to think straight, right? Mm -hmm. And it's designed to be that way because our, our thinking brain comes second, our, our survival brain, which is in the deeper parts of our, our brain, turns online way faster. So you can jump away from a moving car, or jump away from a threat. Um, but we've forgotten that, many of us have forgotten that, you know, when we're dealing with, 
our modern day problems, our reptilian brain is still responding as if your boss in the uh, CEO's meet, you know, uh, suite is a tiger, <laughs> right? <laughs> your body's still responding as if that's the the threat when it's not necessarily maybe a physical threat, but it's an emotional yeah. threat. The brain can't really tell the difference between an emotional and a physical threat. It's just a threat and it will yeah. mobilize those survival energies in order to keep you safe. So, um, I also use brain spotting, so brain spotting and other uh, somatic techniques, but primarily brain spotting. Um, and it's a modality that uses eye positions to get access to the physical or visceral sensations. So again, using you as an example, if you were telling me you were having, you know, whatever issue it was, I would say, okay, I want you to just notice the sensations. And then I would use a pointer like this um where it's like an extendable pointer you would use for teaching or pointing at a whiteboard or something and we're going to go across your line of sight and we're going to look for an eye position where stacy you would say oh my gosh right there i feel even more tension in my jaw or i feel even right. more tension in my chest or my hands and then i would invite you to keep your eyes at that spot mm -hmm. and what it does is it helps you focus and anchor into that subcortical region of the brain that's holding the trauma. We're accessing the neural networks of where that experience information or memory lives. Our eyes are literally an extension of our brain. So yes. the brain uses our eyes to scan for information when we're looking at things out in the world. But if you've ever daydreamed, right, and you were staring off into space as you were thinking deeply about something, that was a brain spot. Your brain was holding on that spot as you were pulling up that information so you could focus on it. So brain spotting harnesses that power of the, the eyes and helps on a very deep level to reorganize and rewire traumatic experiences. I like that. Now, these exercises that you teach your patients, can, can people do certain things at home that could help them also. Now, of course, they need the guidance of a psychotherapist in order to learn how to do these things and learn, understand why these things are happening to them. But if a person finds themselves at home and they find themselves either in a panicky mode or a very stressful mode, and they don't know how to handle it at that moment, so nothing negative happens to them, is there some simple exercises that they can, you know, mm -hmm do that will help them get them back to that normality and that level of calmness where they can think clearly? Yeah, there's a few things I could share on air right now that might be useful. And um, I also want to say like, it's not medical advice, so do it at your own risk. But um, if you have really difficult traumatic experiences that you're holding, I would recommend doing this work with a clinician or someone that you trust. But there's little tools really about nervous system regulation and how we can learn to regulate ourselves. So I'll give you an example. I just left an appointment about an hour ago that was really troublesome for me. And mm -hmm. right at the end of the appointment, there was a, an exchange that happened that really got me, caught me off guard. And mm -hmm. I felt myself getting kind of sick to my stomach. I'm like, oh, that's not what I was expecting. And so I had a 45 minute drive before I got here to log in to be with you. And I was holding one hand on my belly and one hand on my chest and just breathing and feeling the pressure, gentle pressure of my hand on my belly and my hand on my chest and saying kind things to myself to help kind of the inner child that got hurt in that exchange and yeah. saying, I love you. I'm right here. Even though you're feeling scared right now, it's okay. I'm right here. So that physical contact on the belly and the chest can feel like comfort and protection. And then noticing your breathing as you're doing that. Some eye movement things that uh, people could do is taking their finger or a pen and putting it maybe eight to 10 inches in front of their uh, face at eye level. You want to try this with me? Sure. Sure. Okay. Is this so, my finger in front of my face? Yep. So go ahead and look at the tip of your finger. So you'll mm -hmm. notice the muscles of your eyes are angled inward. So you can notice what's right in front of you, your finger. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now I want you to look through your finger to whatever is behind it. Okay. So your finger now should look kind of blurry and whatever is behind it should be clear. Now bring your eyesight back to your finger and then switch again and then switch again. And then switch again. Notice what's happening inside for you. Did you have an involuntary breath come at any point? Yes. Each time that I turned and I and I looked to the area where there was cl clearness, yeah, I felt a a um a different type of my body was uh, was breathing differently, more, mm -hmm. and I felt a, a sense of calmness each time I did that. So it yeah. brought me down to wherever I was at that moment to a level of calm, calmness where I was more calmer than I began when I was speaking to you. That's yeah. So that's called the oculocardiac reflex. And when the muscles of the eyes move near and far, their mu the muscles are turning like this. Mm -hmm. When you look at something near, they're pointed inward. When they look at something far, they move outward and it stimulates uh, the vagus nerve. So it'll actually lower your heart rate and lower your respiration. So you notice that deep breath that came, it's involuntary. Yes. Um, people can also look up polyvagal exercises. Those are wonderful for regulating your nervous system. It's kind of like biohacking. You can come off like a panic attack. The near far thing that we just did is a really great way to come back down from a, a panic attack because we're gonna bring you into a more parasympathetic nervous system state. Another one is taking the finger pads of your fingers and those same ocular muscles around your eyes, just really gently pressing on them. Mm -hmm. Not hard, just really light pressure. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that within a few seconds, you're going to have that same involuntary breath. Come on. There it is right there. Yes. Yeah. So there's all sorts of skills like that and, and just learning how to be mindful and tracking our inner sensations. So when we go to the physical level, we can get a lot more information about what's happening for us and inside of us. And then we can make more choices because we have more information versus like, you know, you get activated or triggered by something in your life and then we react. Right. Yeah. And then that often causes more problems because of the reactivity so slowing things down and becoming aware of uh, all of the other senses that are part of how our memories are formed or how we respond to our environment can give us a lot more choices to work with. I like that a lot. Now, um, I noticed, um, well, there's a lot of myths out there where people think that once there a traumatic event happens in their life and once there is some type of um where the brain is really affected by any any traumatic event um that it is very hard to get back to that healing stage some people like even when they've gotten a hit on the head that you know they might get post traumatic stress disorder or the stress might bring it on or you know things could happen and they th don't realize that the, the brain has the capability to heal itself with the proper guidance and the proper training that your brain can heal itself. Now, can you go into more, um, more detail about that? Because a lot of people don't realize that the brain does have the capability of healing itself. Many people think, you know, once something happens, that's it. And a lot of people will just go straight to medication and they don't even think about, you know, psychotherapy. They don't think about any type of therapy or training. They just go right to the medication and they think, okay, and then all these symptoms start to happen because of the medication. And not only are they battling with, you know, their, their problem is being masked because those medications are taking away the symptoms. So you don't feel it, but the problem psych psychologically is still there. If, you know, you're just, it's just blocking those emotions. So you don't feel it. So the problem doesn't, doesn't fix itself. It's just masking the emotions and masking those feelings that are still there in your brain. So you don't feel it. So you don't react to it, but 
you're not healing it. You're just masking those symptoms by taking medication. Maybe you can go more in depth about that and explain why it's so important to add to, to have a, a psychotherapy and to have training to, and how it is possible to, you know, have the brain for it, the brain to heal itself. Mm -hmm. I think that as a humanity and as a culture, we have forgotten the capacity of our bodies and what our bodies do for us and what our, our brain and body can do. Um, that innate healing capacity lives within every living creature that is on this planet. It's mm -hmm. hardwired into us to adapt. Yeah. Uh, the survival instinct is powerful and all living beings have it. So yeah. um, I think we're in a time of great remembrance. I would say that people are starting to remember that their bodies, their, their minds, their spirits have what it needs to recognize that we were already whole and that we actually forgot you know, because of the wounds and pain or not receiving care when we needed it. There's a place for medications. Um, yes. I also believe that they're heavily overused mm -hmm. and they come with a lot of side effects. Um, I think that it, this healing capacity, I'll give you an example. If you get a cut on your leg, mm -hmm. you don't even have to think about it right? It's autonomic. It's deeply hardwired in that you're going to grow a scab. If, if the rest of you is doing pretty okay and you're healthy, yeah. you're going to grow a scab and it's going to heal. You don't mm -hmm. even have to think about it. This, right. this, you know, creature yeah. self that we are in a physical form has profound capacities for uh, survival and th for thriving too, not just survival. So yeah. on a brain level, I would say one of the limitations of psychotherapy and medications, et cetera, is that um, we're we're covering up the the issue. And sometimes we need it. So I'm not saying don't take your meds, but like there's also something to be said about having the support of someone, especially people, like for me, I've, I've survived addiction. I've survived a lot of trauma. Um, mm -hmm. I've been doing work on myself for almost 20 years now actively. And if it wasn't for the therapists and healers in my life that could reflect back to me, the love and the c compassion and care and believing in me that I could, he I could heal. I wouldn't be here today doing that for other people. Right. So it takes sometimes the power of connection, which also we can't underestimate. We're living right. really separate from one another now, right? There's a lot of paranoia. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on in the world. It's pretty heavy these days. And we've lost that power of being able to trust our human companions in the world because we don't feel safe. Yeah. So when you create a container for someone that is relatively safe because I don't think there's something uh, as absolutely absolute safety I don't believe that that necessarily exists on planet earth yeah but relatively safe and you become a mirror for someone a mirror that reflects the truth and the depth of who that person is which is love which is the connection then the body recognizes and can, and the mind and maybe the spirit can recognize, Hey, I can heal. Right. It's in the disconnection when we don't have access to ourselves that we just keep looping in the same stories and the same pain on a physiological level. Um, the brain is capable of neuroplasticity and there's, I mean, thousands of research studies on this topic and uh, there's a there's a wonderful book called the brain the brain that changes itself and for some reason I'm not remembering the author right now but uh, mm -hmm. the brain that changes itself it's a a, a host of stories of people who've 
uh, recovered from brain injuries, Parkinson's, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing that is required is the belief that you yeah. can heal mm -hmm. and having someone else then also believe in you too. Sure. Maybe there's certain kinds of brain injuries or other things that I used to work in a brain, brain injury uh, clinic for addiction and TBI for a long time. Um, and I saw people heal. There were certain aspects where their brain had changed and they would need to adapt around that, but mm -hmm. we never gave up on what their system could be capable of doing. So neuroplasticity uh, is real. And when we lower stress hormones, we lower the cortisol, we lower and remove people out of stressful conditions, the body naturally starts to repair itself. Furthermore, yeah. if you add nutrition, if you add um, exercises, that, you know, all those things, you are setting yourself up for success. And so that's what I try to do with people is looking at it from a lot of different angles and figuring out in collaboration with a lot of other providers that they might be working with. What does this person need yes. to, to be whole again? I like that. I like that a lot. I think it's so necessary. I think, I think people don't realize that the brain can heal itself. I think people, there's so many people that just go right to the medications and they just don't realize that it's just blocking those emotions. It's just not like I just mentioned, you know, five minutes earlier, you know, it's not healing the trauma that's causing those, the, the, you know, all these problems, you know, and, and with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, you know, can people actually um, overcome that? Or once you're diagnosed with that, is that like, you know, you're diagnosed with it and that's it? Or is is it something that can like other, um, like other conditions, can it, can you actually overcome it? And, you know, through the proper, you know, training? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I have seen people transform um, and, depending on, you know, that, that person's history and their story and how much trauma there is, it might take some time, but, um, you can, and it doesn't mean sometimes you won't like dip your toe back in it, you know, cause that the, those grooves that are in the nervous system and inside of the brain, you know, the roads we've traveled the most with our thoughts and our emotions, the stories that we've been told or tell ourselves, um, it takes a, a while for those shadows to like fully disappear, but yeah. yes, I believe that that's possible. I've witnessed it. I've been privileged to be in a position where I can do that work with people. And I, I mean, I was not a functional human for a long time. Right. I couldn't even tie my shoes. I was smoking crack and shooting up dope for eight years. So, um, my brain has been put back together with therapies like brain spotting and breath work and uh, psychedelics and other things. And for the most part, I'm a pretty functional human. There's still times that I'll have an, you know, an episode where it feels like, Oh crap, we're back in it again, but they don't last as long. Mm -hmm. And there's more of me that's grown around it that can navigate just like I was telling you on the way home from that appointment that I was like, Oh, I'm really, really feeling the vibrations. And I'm really activated and triggered by this. And then I tended to myself and I feel okay. Right. So mm -hmm. healing is possible. And I really want the message to be clear for anyone who's watching or listening is that you're wired for healing and you have everything you need inside of you. You just don't, you don't have the bridge to get there. It's not that you don't have it. It's that the bridge mm -hmm. isn't there and we're going to help you build the bridge. And is there a specific type of training that you, you take your clients through or it really depends on the person and what they're going through. They get a personalized, um, you really look at it from a personal perspective and you train them according to what exactly is going on. So everybody has their own personalized program, you know, because sometimes you go into places and they have those standard programs, but, you know, everybody is different. So I would assume everybody gets their own personalized training according to what is going on in their current lives. Is that absolutely. true? Yeah, absolutely. There's not one person 
each human being is a unique constellation. I'm, I, it just doesn't make sense to me because I'm like, okay, wait, we all have different DNA. Yeah. We all are unique. We all have different personalities and stories. So why in the world would I have you just go, you know, like a cow through a shoot, the same yeah. thing? Um, it requires deep listening, really deep witnessing to see someone in front of you and work with them to figure out what they need. Um, so yes, there's therapy, you know, really individualized for people. I primarily also train therapists to do mm -hmm. this type of work with others, um, and, you know, teach trainings in that regard. So sometimes we're doing brain spotting. Sometimes we're doing a mix of things. Sometimes we need to get, um, support like with ketamine assisted psychotherapy or working with medicines like cannabis. And when the other ones start to become legalized, we'll probably be adding them as well. Other times it's a lot of times it's silent work and you're not talking because the brain is reprocessing. Some people need more talking because that's what helps them feel safe. So the main thing is it's not about me. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us in therapy school, were trained to be the expert. I'm not the expert in anyone's life. They are. Yes. So there's a unlearning that when I teach people, we have to go back to being humble and we have to go back to being in uncertainty because you don't know everything that lives inside of someone. And what we want to do is help their nervous system take us where it needs to go at the pace yes. that it's ready to go at versus what I think it wants to do um so it's it has to be unique for people to be to feel truly seen right and see them in the totality of who they are so basically really what what a, a psychotherapy a psychotherapist does is they're really helping you learn how to release those negative emotions that are triggering you to cause you the 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 trauma it's, it's uh, you know that, that you already have but it's not it's not being released it's in you it's affecting you it's making you progress and it's it's it's, it's making you stagnant where you can't live a healthy and and functional life so your tools and your strategies according to each individual is being utilized and you're teaching them different tools, different strategies, different coping mechanisms that they could apply to their daily lives where it, over time, it probably becomes just natural that they don't even realize they're doing it. And it's just, it's just a part of their daily life, but it's, it's helping them to release all that negativity, to release all that trauma, to release all those negative thoughts so they can actually focus on the present and not let that trauma from the past really affect them now or in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Trauma has a way of when the body experiences something traumatic, it stores it um, as a, as a traumatic memory. And so it does that to protect us from future traumatic events that might be exactly like it. So if you were a little kid and you touched a hot stove, it's going to get that memory in there. Anytime you go near a hot stove with your hand, it's going to come up like, Ooh, don't touch that. Yeah. Now that can be useful and the brain is going to use the sensory perception that it has with our eyes, ears, you know, touch, smell, all of that. Yeah. And maybe you're, you know, maybe you had a really terrible relationship with someone and there was negativity and abuse. And now you're in a different relationship, but this person's awesome. Yet right. if anything looks, smells, feels, you know, or sounds like something that yeah. happened in the past, you know, the thing that kept you alive then is going to keep you from living now. And you might have really re strong reactions that almost your brain is thinking the thing that happened in the past is happening right now. So what right. we do in brain spotting therapy is we help desensitize mm -hmm. and de discharge that old stored energy. And we go mm -hmm. right to the place in the brain that that happens. So talk therapy has a a harder time getting access to those things. I actually want to speak to this. <laughs> this is my, yeah, one of my biggest, <laughs> biggest uh, shares, important shares, of, like deviating from the way that we've been doing psychotherapy work is that think, thinking and talking are frontal lobe activities. So it's yeah. the newest part of our brain, the neocortex that knows how to think critically and how to make judgment and decisions and math and um, 
and language, our frontal lobe has very little to do with emotional regulation. Mm -hmm. Our emotional re regulation centers are in the midbrain and then the brainstem also mm -hmm. plays a role in that. And there's no language there. Yeah. So what we're doing as talk therapists is we're trying to literally jam all this wonderful stuff that we're saying and mm -hmm. try to get it from the frontal part of the brain into this midbrain to change yeah. the way that we feel. It doesn't work very fast, if at all. Mm -hmm. the, the healing rates, you know, even looking at studies of like CBT, um, really low, really low and not long lasting. Yeah. So talk therapy is considered a top down approach where mm -hmm. we're trying to get from the frontal lobe and down into the brain and the body. Yeah. Bottom up approach is when we go to the felt sense first. Mm -hmm. We bypass this thing that's full of defenses, full of where we, you know, tell ourselves yeah. all sorts of things that maybe aren't exactly accurate and we're bypassing it and just getting to the core of where it's held. So it works much faster and it changes it on a physiological level. Wouldn't it be awesome to leave a therapy session, not just with like tools and some ideas, but to actually feel different when you, oh. the state of being that you walked in with is no longer there. You don't have that heaviness in your shoulders or that feeling of being numb or out of touch or that panic anxiety, you know, people are suffering and it's, it's emotions are physical. They're not thoughts. So right. I just wanted to share that, that the approach of a somatic uh, clinician is very different than the neuroscience is backing all of this up. So I would not be surprised that 20, 30 years from now, we are going to be, this is going to be normal. This is yeah. when you think of a therapist, it's going to be, I'm going to go to do processing work, rewiring work. And instead of just going and talking to someone and there's a right. place for talking, I don't want to poo poo on that. There is, but I think it falls short in my own experience as an, as an addict, I went to rehab eight times. I was institutionalized for two and a half years. I had therapists from age 13 up until 20 in yeah. all of those treatments that I had, I could teach treatment. I still right. don't stay sober. And no one ever asked me about my trauma. I didn't even know I had trauma. That's crazy. <laughs> Eight years. I almost died many times. All my friends are dead. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is serious. And I yeah. want, I want the community to hear it, that the problems that we're dealing with and facing now as a people and in the environment and politics and all the disaster that just happened with Hurricane Helene, like there's help there's real yeah. help and you can heal. You can heal. Oh, I, I agree a hundred percent with you. And I, I, I feel like you, when you do speak to a therapist and you, you verbally get it out, it's a temporary fix, but I feel like the emotions are still regressed in your body. Like you could yeah. feel it. And then you just need to say something or something needs to remind you of something. And then all those emotions just come and they flourish and, and you start feeling the pain or the sadness or whatever emotions that are making you feel that a certain way from that specific event that occurred. I feel talking to a therapist is great. I a hundred percent, you know, back it but I feel like it's more of a, a temporary fix. They're giving you tools and they're, they're talking to you and they're making you see things from a different perspective. But I feel like those emotions are still in you, you know, um, it, 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 you know, all you need is one little thing, a word, a phrase, a, a certain thing that happens that just reminds you of another event. And then, you know, many times emotions will just flourish and I'll start feeling those emotions. And, you know, it, it, I think by having a psychotherapist and by really learning how to tap into those emotions and then learn how to release those emotions is so important because, you know, having a, a, a therapist where you could verbally, you know, talk about it is wonderful, but being able to tap into those, those emotions that have been pulling you down and then learn how to release them, I think is, is such a satisfying and such a traumatic way to overcome 
and to move forward in life because you could, you could, you know, temporary feel good and you can, you know, remind yourself of what the therapist says and you could apply certain things. But if you don't get rid of those negative emotions, they'll be repressed. And all you do is you need a trigger point. And that's why sometimes you see people with post-traumatic stress disorder, they're fine. And then all of a sudden something you say, it doesn't have to be anything. It could be two or three words and it just reminds them of something else and they go off and they don't mean to, but it just something from their past just triggered them from the present moment. And it could be just two words or three words or, you know, and that goes for anything. You know, you don't have to have post-traumatic stress disorder. You can just something, you know, traumatic happened and in the present moment of your life, you just have something that just, you know, triggers something. And then all those thoughts and all those things just start coming through your head and then the emotions start just flourishing. And for some people, it might be crying. Some people it might be just inner sadness, you know, and it, it, it will, you know, it will bring trauma, you know, mm -hmm. all back into the, into the picture. So I, I think that psychotherapy is, is, is definitely a, something that people should be aware of. I don't think everybody knows what a psychotherapist does. Uh, you know, I don't think it's, it's heard enough. You hear the word therapist all the time, but when do you, you know, it's, it's kind of like the word epilepsy. You don't hear it very much, you know, psychotherapist, you hear it here and there, but how many people really know about it? And they need to know more about it because it's such an important, you know, um, job for, you know, for a psychotherapist to be able to teach someone how to release those emotions, I think is, is, is so important because that's really, if you can release those emotions and you can learn if they come back, you can learn how to get rid of them. You know, it, it, it's, it's a game changer in your life. You know, it's, it's a total game changer, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, psychotherapists we're not first responders a lot of the time we're secondary responders mm -hmm. to things that are happening you know in in our communities and in people's lives and uh, I think it is an under aware role um, and also access is difficult in a lot of uh, places and for a lot of people I wish that a lot of the things that we do with our clients were taught in schools and taught from a really young age I think we would be living in a very different world if that were the case because what we're sometimes that what I'm doing in my office feels like I'm just teaching people how to be human <laughs> yeah and like honor their humanness and yeah. learn to be okay with that um, but yeah it's a, a sacred space that we hold and and there's lots of ways to or, for healing there's not just psychotherapy I, right I've experienced in my own life beautiful incredible healers from different paths and different walks of life that can do things that I don't do um, and fill a really necessary space in the world uh, with all of the things that are going on more of us are needed I think Oh, a hundred percent. Now, if you had to take today's conversation and you really wanted to emphasize on some important factors, what are some things you really like to share with the listeners today that you feel that are very important that you feel that they should be emphasized? Mm -hmm. um, I, number one, want to reiterate that your body knows how to heal and um, that if you've been looking for healing and you haven't received it yet, that's not your fault. Mm -hmm. It's more so that the structure and the system and the way that we do things in the field haven't necessarily caught up to mm -hmm. what, what is really necessary sometimes in healing trauma, which is brain and body focus yeah. um, and adding the element of, you know, deeper, perhaps spirituality too, for those that are uh, wanting that. Um, so much of our system has been like medicalized and yeah. it's sort of sterile, right? So it's lost. It's like warmth or human connection. Um, it's there, but it's harder to find. Right. So it's not your fault if you haven't, if you've been trying and it hasn't worked, you probably need a different kind of therapy. Right. right. And so some ideas I have is to, when you're looking for a therapist, look ask someone about whether they work on themselves mm -hmm. so like i'm not going to work with a therapist who doesn't do their own work it's, yeah it's 
directly correlated to how effective they will be because it'll affect how they can relate to you. If they haven't healed their own emotional wounds or relational wounds, that's going to show up in connection with someone else. And then also look for a type of therapy that goes beyond talk therapy and helps you get into the felt sense. Um, The felt sense is old. That sensory perception system came way before language. It's millennia Mm -hmm. old. So we want to get to where the roots are um, of these traumatic experiences and and heal them that way. And uh, educate yourself. You know, if you get told something about, oh, you have this condition and you're not going to get better, I want to call BS on that. (laughs) I don't know Mm -hmm. if I can curse on this. So I mean, (laughs) okay, well, I'm calling bullshit on that. Mm -hmm. Um, The body and the, the, system is designed for healing so it's designed for adaptation we think of adapting as like oh you know like when you go for a run right your heart rate's going to increase your respiration's going to increase and then when you stop running it's going to go back down we always think of homeostasis as this thing that's like physical but we have emotional homeostasis calm grounded loving content open curious joyful those are our natural baseline states of being and so if you if a client calls me and they're like i want to do therapy with you i'm struggling with this or that their nervous system is already saying hey i need help i need healing i've been trying to do it on my own but i need attunement i need connection i need a sense of safety in order to heal so it's that that healing capacity is already online it's looking right And so recognizing that inner wisdom, the other thing, last thing is that we are our own medicine. Mm -hmm. We are, we are the medicine we're looking for. Yeah. We create access to those parts of ourselves that we've disconnected from or had to disconnect from. We find ourselves, we find the joy, we find all the goodness after we can grieve and dust off, you know, the pain. And that's where we find our gifts. We can't selectively numb. Right. right? You can't choose when you go through something and you numb out. A lot of times you can't choose that you're numbing out, but you also can't choose what you numb out. Yeah. So you numb out all the good stuff too. And so when you do this work, it, it pays off in spades. Yeah. So. 100%. I like that a lot. Now, like, I know you, you said something that you have a newsletter and in that newsletter, you go over some really important things that if they sign up for the newsletter, they get, they learn a lot about a lot of different things. Can you tell everybody about your newsletter? Sure. Yeah. We have a series uh, and I'm still adding to it, but we have a series of um, emails that go out. If you sign up for the newsletter that talks about trauma and gives you kind of tidbits of, of things every, um, a few few days or weeks so that you can stay informed and learn more so if you want to visit my website it's uh, www.awakenconsultingservices.com so a w a k e n c o n s u l t i n g services.com um, i teach trainings as well for clinicians or uh, people that are doing healing work on how to do brain spotting and work with trauma. Um, And then there's some things you can find if you sign up for the newsletter, there's a free video too that you get about trauma and brain spotting. And um, we have retreats and events and all sorts of things that we're working on on the team here for creating spaces of healing people in our community. We've launched our breathwork series as well. So once a month, we have an online breathwork workshop. You can find it on that website. If you click on the awakened roots, that's our holistic side of things. We're uh, offering energy medicine and more spiritual stuff and breath work. So yeah, check us out if you want to do some healing work. Breath work is also a really powerful way to rapidly change um, from being in a stressed out state or working with you know healing from trauma. So yeah. I love that. And so people, if they, if they want your services, they could also probably get it on zoom also that they don't have to be in in your area. They can, they can schedule an appointment through zoom. Correct. 
That's correct. Yeah. I, my, I'm full right now. I have a really long wait list um, that I'm working through, but um, my husband is also a brain spotting clinician and a breath worker. And so he's seeing a lot of folks now too. So if you're interested, you need some help or healing this resonated with you, reach out to us. I love it. I love it. This has been amazing. Uh, I thank you so much for coming on this show. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's so important that you, um, you get this across to people, you know, the message that you shared today and people understand the power of psychotherapy and the power of breath work and the power of, you know, really tapping into your emotions and then letting go of those emotions. And that, you know, it's really important, you know, not just to talk about it, but to learn how to let go of those emotions. Because like I, you mentioned, you know, talking is more of the frontal cortex of the brain where, you know, you go the midbrain and, and the stem of the brain is really where the emotions lie. And that's where we really have to tap into and learn how to release, you know, mm -hmm. so we can actually have a health, healthy, happy and, and functional, you know, uh, life, you know, and that's what everybody wants. We want to be healthy, we want to be happy and we want to be productive. So right. I thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing all this information and I really do appreciate you. Thank you, Maria, for coming on the show. I, I love this time together. You are an amazing woman and you have come a long way. So I give you kudos and, you know, you've gone through a lot, you know, and you, you focused on really using everything that happened to you into making it a positive. And now you're helping so many others. So, you know, I give you kudos and thank you so much for being you, you know, I really do. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Appreciate you allowing me to express myself and share my message. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, you have a great day. You too. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.